Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Speculative Speculations. I'm Vasha. I'm Jared. I'm Chris. And I'm Dan. And Steve is here too. Uh, <laughs> but while he gets ready to get sorted out, this is a sci-fi podcast where we talk about sci-fi stories in all their forms. Today we're going to be talking about chapters 5 through 15 of Authority which is the second book of the Southern Reach series by Jeff Vandermeer, where our short story pick for the day is Sultana's Dream by Rokhaya Shekhawat Hussain. We'll talk about the authority chapters first and then move on to Sultana's Dream. So uh, a good set of chapters. That was fun. And I feel like a lot of theories panned out a little bit or at least had a bit more weight added to them in this one. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to continue Chris's obsession of rabbits uh, or replace them with um, Whitby. I, I'm, I'm, I have my eye on Whitby. <laughs> yeah, what do you think is going on with him? I think he. it's likely that he ate some <laughs> plants mm. because he looked <laughs> strangely at control when he asked if anybody ate any of the plants. <laughs> and, if he did consume that or something else, maybe he had some rabbit, some possessed rabbit, <laughs> maybe. I um, And something else. Wait, he had a few. Oh, yeah. And he brought the rotten honey smell with him wherever he went. Did you mm. notice that? And I think he's the one who's been ransacking people's offices because the bugs had the rotten honey smell, which he mm. also smelled in the car with mm. Whitby and Cheney. So we're down to like, Two people and Cheney. That's good. Yeah. Right? Or am I doing my yeah, doing pronunciations? So. Okay. Yeah. That could be him, I guess. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he's suspicious all the time. Also, the cleaners, the cleaning stuff in the cupboard that they saw apparently has some lime perfumes. So why is he smelling rotten honey? <laughs> Who, who knows? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. What does rotting honey even smell like? I thought I thought honey yeah. was one of the things that doesn't rot. It lasts right? forever. I thought. I thought. And it's like growing fungus on it or something. <laughs> yeah. I thought it meant it's sort of like a rotting sweet smell, you know, when there's like vegetables or like fruit that's rotting and it smells sort of sweet. Mm. Vegetables and that's how I imagine yeah. it, sort of. It's like extremely cloying, sweet smell. Yes. Yeah. But sort of yeah. decaying too, right? But mm. a bit nauseating sort of smell. Yeah. And and he feels more at home in the cathedral. He said he feels more safe in that sample cathedral, which mm -hmm. you would think, oh, he likes the higher oxygen levels. Or the the area X side of him feels more at home in that place. Also, he acts like he doesn't remember what he talked about with control uh, about when he asked about the room. And that was one other bit I'm forgetting. But anyway, he's just really suspicious. So either he's really got something going on with him or we're just being extremely misled with this character and the problem is somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I is he... Because um, one of the things I noticed uh, was that the um the part of the section the chapter where it says chapter 10 where it says fourth breach um we have that's when he had the um the mosquito on the windshield when mm. he's uh mm. talking to control and he's like he had no memory of swatting it or anything like that and then the very next chapter um chapter 11 says sixth breach so we skipped the fifth one and i was like and and we skipped two in between because the first chapter yeah. is first breach and yeah. then we did fifth no it's fourth breach and sixth like so i was like okay we're not getting the full story here something's something's missing mm -hmm. you know why why do we have different breaches and 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 that 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 sixth breach was uh was like something crawling across the roof and fits and starts 
but it wasn't enough to wake the cat. And then, um, but then when he runs into Whit Whitby, that is the seventh breach, and he runs into Whit Whitby with this um, unbearable yet beautific agony deformed in its features. He, he called it an it. He called Whitby an it before he named named him as Whitby. And uh, and I'm like, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> and the first breach, I think all the other breaches, they seem to be someone ransacking his office or something that he suspected was invading his space. But the first breach, I, I don't remember, but I don't think there was any such invasion. What he what happened at the end of that chapter was that he found the writing on the wall that the. <laughs> Yeah, I I, I associated that first breach with the plant, hmm. um, but right. that was because that's where that's when he found the plant and the mouse, the dead mouse and stuff like that. So that's that's kind of what where my mind went there, and then hmm. uh, yeah, like like I said, we we we're missing breaches here. We're, we're uh, and um, so I don't know what's going on with that. Are we well, what do you get... think the breach is? Do you think it's a breach of his privacy or? I'm assuming it was a breach, breach. Okay. a breach from Area X. That's mm. breaching into our world. That's 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 mm. what I assumed. Mm. Uh, maybe maybe it's something different, but um, but that was the uh, and so. What does Whitby have to do with a breach? Is he is something from Area? Is he you know a, a zombie or whatever? Whatever's coming over from Area Area X, uh, some mm. you know somebody who's been taking control of whatever you know. Uh, so you know, questions among questions here keep popping up. <laughs> there's there's also this line about breaches that I found very interesting and can't say I could make a whole lot of sense of. This simult this um, I, I think the first part is important, not important, but would be ah the sun. This simultaneous with parallel universes of per perception opening between him and Whitby as he spoke, because control felt as if Whitby were talking about breaches in Italix. The same breaches so much on his mind on a daily basis. So, it mm -hmm. is it is he thinking of Area X breaches or is it some other breach mm -hmm. that he is now starting to associate with Area X? Hmm. Maybe. Oh, could it be that Control is thinking that he's worried about stuff breaching Area X from the outside, but maybe it's sort of the breaches are the other way around or something mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, that didn't come up. That uh, I think we talked about that a little bit last week when we talked about is Area X invading our world um, yeah. as much as we're trying to invade it and find out stuff about it uh but we don't know that yet but with these with this section that we read and these breaches keep getting mentioned i'm starting to think that area x is starting to have an effect on on the regular world because there's a lot of things that we are assuming is being done by people you know what i mean who is yeah. doing that who's placing the phone for instance in his bag all that kind of stuff we're assuming that there's that of these kind of new people that we've met like being etc that it's somebody within that payment student but literally as usual anything's on the table here in terms of yeah. what what the possibilities are you know mm -hmm. steve are you gonna say something no i was just okay. um yeah just thinking about these chapters lot lots to just lots of i don't want to jump too far ahead but <laughs> i think we picked a good point to end the mm -hmm. week mm -hmm. But you, I think part of it is that there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of things that control doesn't know. And I think that's, it's almost, we are, we're along for the ride. We know as much as the characters do and we have bits and pieces and we're missing really big, really big parts of the story. So I think it, it keeps us in the dark as much as the characters are in the dark who are supposed to be the ones in the know. So it makes you wonder who, who knows who, who is pulling the strings, who is keeping this information and why are they keeping that information from these characters? Because if they're the people who are leading these ex these expeditions, and shouldn't they know? I mean, shouldn't they? I still think his mother knows more than he does, and she may be pulling strings. Mm -hmm. 
I I think I mean I have absolutely no reason to think <laughs> this, but I think she's the voice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I liked how it wasn't some like um, it wasn't like mother from like the alien franchise, like the alien movie, like like this like robotic. It's like this almost like a person who you call who's like waiting by a phone, and you might catch him on the run and be like, "What? Like what? What is it now?" Instead of it being like, you know, "Hello, control, how are you?" Or you know, it was kind of kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Did he didn't have any musings this time about how he might be locked in an aquarium or something? Right? But I think he did still have some interesting imagination <laughs> about the voice yeah so speaking of area x breaching into the real world mm -hmm. so we found out that they've been eating the rabbits that have been hanging around the border yeah. and making them into pets <laughs> some of them could have been returnees from area x we don't know okay right. yeah <laughs> wouldn't that be a great way to if if area x is infecting our world wouldn't that be a great delivery system yeah yeah <laughs> i think so <laughs> for sure that's yeah. so you remember back to when so we pointed out a few things last week where control has all these musings where he thinks that there are like two people uh in whitby or there are these i, I think we have evidence now to believe that that sort of true in some sense even if he's just having a psychotic break uh, something's going on with him there's like a different version of the guy and this other thought he has to himself where the people in the town aren't quite what they seem is it because they've been eating rabbit mm. <laughs> maybe <laughs> but i mean if but rabbits I mean, can exit area x then other things can exit too right there's other animals and birds and things, yeah. right? There's an exit. Yeah, mosquitoes and things crawling on the ceiling. Yeah. That, that's what I was thinking, yeah. But, but they are very blasé about everything. You know, they're very... Uh, how do we know that these are the rabbits let go? Oh, it could be, the, or it might not be. And it's like, well, do you not think that would be kind of worth... Uh, well, that's that's covering? part of the mystery here, Chris, is that it, it, he's... His... Uh, like I love the mystery of him trying to just figure out his own people. Never yeah. mind like Area X. He he hasn't <laughs> even figured out his own people yet, you know. And he keeps coming up with new mysteries every time he r goes up and talks to one of these people. And it's yeah. like, oh, now and now there's something else weird about this guy. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's kind of it's kind of hilarious mm -hmm. because uh, you don't know what he's gonna find out more about first, his own people or Area <laughs> X, you know, through uh, right. through his own research that when he's taking apart his office, his his former the former director's office, and uh, it, it's just uh, it's kind of a parallel mystery that he's got going on here, and um, and 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 at the same time, like you said earlier, we we are finding out with him you know mm. um maybe we're the same thing every time he seems to discover things about area x or about the people it seems to also get information about area x right so yeah mm -hmm. very so. connected everything is yeah connected yeah. so yeah i think part of them being really really casual about the about the area and all the kind of everyone seems kind of like relaxed is because you can only be so i think this reminds me of, of another series we're reading you can only have so much so much once once you're i would imagine once you're stationed there you could you only have so much energy to be so focused on it for so long once it's there for a while you you can't be you, you can't have that level of intensity all the time it'll just become mundane after a while mm -hmm. it just becomes like oh there's there's the rabbits that may or may not be from area x like that may be a <laughs> A mutant bunny, it may not be. Oh well, and I think it just becomes like a normal daily thing. So they just they become very kind of. Oh, well, it's Tuesday. Like it's not a big deal anymore. I I really I mean the contrast slash irony in the fact that you know they don't care that the the rabbits have basically invaded the world <laughs> versus the or that anything could have come out of area x like there's they're guarding one entrance to it and as far as we know i think that that's it that's the only place they've posted their guard and neither expedition 11 uh 11.5 dot h or whatever that was 
neither that nor the expedition 12 people have exited from there. <laughs> so you know there are other exits. So you're not like trying to find them. But <laughs> meanwhile, there's this huge cathedral place that apparently has like five different airlocks that you have to enter through when you're preventing contamination to what end? <laughs> what are you achieving by locking all of that in? So mm. I guess the ultra safety in one place <laughs> and the complete like lack of, um, I guess, yeah, what, what Steve said, it's just another Tuesday. It doesn't matter if, you know, rabbits show up from here. I mean, they do have military surrounding the whole perimeter and like boats also on the outside, but mm -hmm. it's not even just no one, but. Yeah. When you, you, if you try to, if someone tries to sneak in, they'll be incinerated or be, so it makes you wonder how the director, the previous director, how they yeah. were able to get in and out, or I'm going to imagine they got out, but is there another exit? Or is there another way that they're coming back? Because you would imagine they would find another exit by now, right? Yeah. I, I think there has to be, right? Or at least there there are some blind spots in this exit that um, because apparently none of the Expedition 11 returnees came back through that door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but maybe they teleport outside or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they turn into bunny rabbits and they sneak back over and then they just kind of <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Ride the bunny rabbits. Just just don't kill the wrong them. one because you might be eating your colleague on accident. And be like, oh this is John. <laughs> Whoops. Oh wow, I'm sorry. Maybe. Tasty. <laughs> but yeah, I think you're right, Steve, about like what you're saying that um it's a bit weird about how they're all well, some stuff is very secure, some stuff is very blessy. But I guess it's all about routine, like he said. Like they fall into a routine and they just follow just like the expeditions. At a certain point, they're just routinely changing random variables. Nobody seems to care that much, I guess. They're just doing it because that's the way they've been doing it. Right? And it, it, it kind of makes sense. It kind of seems a little bit more realistic that they have like these staffing shortages. Like, like there's less mm -hmm. people working on it. You would imagine an, an event this big in a place like Gary X would have all the resources pumped into it. So why are they struggling with funding and with staffing and they're, they're cutting employees, you know, they're less people devoted to it. So it makes you wonder, it, was it a security thing? Is that why they have less people, less, less people in the know, less people kind of keeping it tighter or is there a financial reason that they're keeping it small? Well, it's been like, 30 years, right? 20 years? Yeah, yeah. It's been a while. Like, they're probably like, nothing is happening here. It seems contained. Why do we need to keep... Well, we've kind of gotten a conflicting view because on one hand, they, they ha it was mentioned that it's expanding slowly. On the other hand, I think someone mentions this time that it's not. There's no proof that it is expanding. Yeah. I think expansion was like a feeling or something was hmm. theorizing. Like, I don't think it was like they know it's expanding or changing or anything, right? But I think I think we also saw that there's like different factions within the organization, like and some people might be more in favor of more funding to REX and some people not for many reasons. I don't know. Like I actually we don't even know what the organization is. Is it the CIA? <laughs> what is it? Mm -hmm. It's like a it... secret, sir, because they work against like terrorists, right? They say like control has worked against terrorist cells and yeah. undercover stuff. So I don't know. And it kind of makes sense whether it's a government thing. You'd have the bureaucracy, the the yellow, the red tape, the, all the. So I think it's it probably would end up happening that way. Like after thirty years, it'd be like, well, there's other things to worry about. Or if it's like a corporate kind of thing, that it's like there's no money in this. Like we're just sending people and they're dying and. If they come back with this bad press, you know, it's, it kind of makes sense that they would be um, losing interest in it. There's not really, is if, if it's just science, then it's like, you know, I don't know, be a small, a more a small group that would really like truly care about it, and those people probably wouldn't have the money to to do it, which is sad. Yeah. But it, um, yeah, I'm sure it was a uh, hot button campaign item the, the when it first happened, but after 30 years. Uh, you know, the, the public probably got sick of hearing about it and uh, 
politician is probably going to sick of talking about it. <laughs> I mean, you can think of a lot of environmental disasters in the real world that was like, when it happens, like, oh, God, this is so dangerous and there will yeah. be so much remediation. And then after even like a year, everyone forgot about it. Yeah. You know what it's like. Yeah. Yep. That happens. Yeah. Especially if it's not yielding results like it, like it isn't yeah. at the moment. Like it's right. still, you know, there, as right. we have seen, we thought there was only 12 expeditions, but there's been 30 odd expeditions because they sort of keep on changing was, it up and moving it forward. That was, was a nice revelation. <laughs> um, and, and, and the event of, of like why they're not investigating some stuff, like even the fact that the linguist who seemed to be quite high up, she didn't have security clearance for everything either. So like it's not like everybody has, it's not like a whole team working in the same direction. They're all kind of working in their own little bits and kind of being very siloed. So um, maybe there isn't the oversight, especially with the change in command now that we've had from the, what the psychologist now to control. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> I thought it was funny that they had to bump up the expedition number because the biologist <laughs> knew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks to her husband <laughs> that the previous expedition was number 11. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The, the linguist seemed to know a lot. I. Like the whole presentation that she gave, the fake PowerPoint presentation, I thought that was really interesting. She's not the same linguist who dropped out of the expedition, right? I, I don't think that's implied anywhere. Yeah, it's not. I'm I didn't pretty think sure she's so. not. But her presentation was very speculative, let's say. Yeah, yeah. The, the lighthouse keeper was back in, I mean, we... We learned a bit more about him, I suppose, some of his history. Mm -hmm. He used to be a preacher, which explains the the character of the language that we see on the wall. Mm -hmm. And the, what else? We learned his oh, name. Saul Evans. <laughs> which yeah. I think is the big revelation of this, this set of chapters. Really? Uh, because, mm, yeah. Tell, do tell. So, at the interview with the biologist, has been nothing. Nothing's been happening. Very large, very one-word answers. Nothing much come from him. And if we're sort of presuming that this form of the biologist has come from area of X, whether it's become, you know, when same person went in and the changed, or some transfer in, in another way. The first time she responded is when she get when he gave away the name Saul Evans very very quickly and she went oh right that was like the shocking thing because there is a reason that nobody uses names in this mm. uh, that everybody has been obscured you know the biologists the psychologists etc and yet we had somebody just give over a name very very quickly mm. and there was a very noticeable uh, change to that information because the biologist then gave a bit something back then you know or a bit to respond back and started conversing a little bit so i feel like the revelation of the name given over has some has some meaning or something to play here that i thought that was quite notable yeah i like that i didn't think of that that makes sense though everybody else is having their name stripped away but this lighthouse mm. keeper we are told his name and the biologist is told doesn't she like feign disinterest or at least i got the impression that she wasn't she didn't care about learning the name because it didn't mean much to her. But do you think she was just feigning disinterest? Yeah, I think, uh, again, this idea that um, and we've speculated a lot of different things, that they could be doing research on outside Area X as much as inside Area X. So that's, again, the first bit of real information that she's been given that she probably didn't already know, you know, in mm -hmm. some ways. Um compared to you know everything else i've been trying to find out you know oh god there's a lot of rabbits went in where did the rabbits come from right we know where the rabbits came from you know <laughs> what yeah. else what else <laughs> what else does not know this bit of Saul evans seemed to be something that she that was not known information certainly at that time hmm. that makes sense and uh i like what the psychologist uh has anyone uh, stopped thinking of the director as the psychologist? I feel like I keep flipping to psychologist instead of director. But <laughs> she, um, she, her summary about the biologist <laughs> uh, and also the rest of her notes on each of the people in the expedition, they felt like almost like character notes that the author may have written <laughs> about mm -hmm. each of them. Mm -hmm. But then... There's also a meta point he makes that she wrote about them as if she was 
casting them in a play or something which i thought was funny but i don't know if there's larger meaning to, <laughs> to that but anyway what she writes about the biologist is that she thinks that she know she understand more about area x than she already knows within a few days like she'd become a part of the environment so mm-hmm. the biologist not talking <laughs> is uh kind of frustrating because she probably knows all about how this thing works by now or a lot of it at least okay do you, <laughs> i was wondering do we know if other people have come out um like alive out of area x because we know like the previous expeditions they all died right after they came out yeah. like we're all wondering if they're clones or not but has anyone else because because we do know there's one now we know there's one survivor of the first expedition right but are there other survivors that we know of well her husband survived for a while but we don't know if yeah. it was him or not or clone or whatever yeah um, long-term survivors yeah but many mm-hmm. long-term survive because he he had cancer or whatever but uh... the first expedition had the survivor right or it was the yeah. first one that, yeah L- lowry lowry mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah yeah i think there was i think they mentioned a few other ones had survived but we mm-hmm. don't really know much about them but there are a okay. few of there were very few but i don't think they mentioned names but i think she meant i think it's mentioned that they there was a a handful that survived had a life after okay which makes you wonder why but i think it's interesting the way the biologist her her discussions changed a lot in her room in her environment she seemed much more um kind of feeling out control and kind of almost like it was almost like a um like an like an interrogation or like an interview technique to to kind of turn the tables on him and try to take control back of that conversation. So I thought that was it went from her being very standoffish and really short answers to being more let's I'll ask you a question and then I'll answer you. You know, you ask mm-hmm. you answer my question and then we'll exchange. And she kind of kept track of okay, that's two questions. So you know, yeah. kind of ask the right question. Uh, let's give me you know. <laughs> Yeah. So it's sort of like she's trying to figure out if you can trust him, sort of, right? It seems. Yeah. Uh, or manipulate him, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> or sure. Like I, th- I think those are some of my still my favorite uh, interactions throughout the book is when those two are mm. kind of doing this almost mental jousting yeah. with each other and kind of trying to draw just a tiny bit because it feels like as a reader. Any real detail that we're going to get is going to come from those conversations. That, that mm, certainly, yeah. that's what it feels like to me. Yeah. Well, there's also something to that because we we were so attached to her from that's the true. first book, so we're we're longing to get more interaction with her, and uh, so it, it, I think I think Vandermeer is playing into that too with the interaction between those two, mm-hmm. knowing that the reader is attached to her from the from the first book and it really uh playing that part up it's it's uh, pretty well done i like it yeah yeah that's good i didn't i didn't really think of that but yeah i do want to see a lot of the biologists i'm very excited whenever there's a biologist mm-hmm. chapter so yeah oh yeah it's like you turn a page oh well <laughs> just like yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh what did you think of um what was i gonna say uh, Chinese theories, do you think those are just uh, there to tell us how boring and talkative he is? Or do you think there is some sensible, possible truths in there? I, I feel like he threw out a lot of, was that his theories or was it in the list of theories that Whitby gave them? The parallel universes and time traveling race. I think- and- hmm. I think the parallel universe was uh, with B, but he didn't seem too serious about that, did he? Mm. Yeah. It, it's kind yeah. of funny because some of that stuff was some of the stuff we were throwing out after we were mm. reading the first book. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and he's bringing all that up in here, and it's like, yeah, yeah, okay, I this see. is a lot of stuff that uh, you know I think that the reader would have thought of you know earlier. 
like is this a parallel universe is this a you know is it yeah, the time thing we brought up a few times i know it was just uh kind of amusing that he that it, do, it does feel like uh it yeah. does feel like Van Der having fun with the reader in this kind of thing of nearly like right. saying, here, just in case you didn't think of it, here's a whole lot of mix of stuff that, 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 that could be, uh, that right. are coming from these, this cast of characters. And everybody has their own theory, a bit like every reader has their own theory, I think. Yeah. And um, it's like yeah. going for it. Now, it, it could be, obviously, they've been working on this for a long time, so it could be based on something, but it also is just another theory to fire on the dumpster truck that's about a million other theories that everybody has. <laughs> It, but it seems Whitby has has his own favorite theory, right? The what's it called, terroir? Oh, yeah. He brought the whole yes. like whole binder or huge stack of um, description of this thing. Yeah. And when it, when it came out, it's like you know, and uh, control is like, well, I don't want to read it right now. I'll read it some other time. <laughs> and it's one of those things that you think like, oh shit, I'm sure there's something important in there. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. should read right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he does concede to some extent about that uh, process. It, he's like, I won't apply to Area X, but I'll apply to this uh, agency department to figure out mm. what everyone's like. So, yeah. Um, so do you guys think the director did go and come back from Area X? I'm nodding. So. Nobody can see me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was gonna say, I, I thought so before, and then the, the fact that again it could have been just thrown in there because the Valdemir thinks the reader speculated this beforehand and sort of having fun with it, but it, it does feel like that, and also the fact that she hasn't come or it doesn't appear that she's come back anyway. Mm. She went somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. It, yeah, it's hard to tell because it, because you know that first book she seemed to know so much, but it was only from the biologist's perspective. So yeah. you're wondering just how much she knew. And uh, but I mean, it makes sense that uh, that she had gone and come back before mm -hmm. um, on some level, just because of all the information yeah. he's getting out of her office without even her being there. You know, so there's there's a lot of information in there so uh it does make sense on some level that she had been there before but how did she get out good question through the door <laughs> did she get out because we've been told that you can yeah right they told the expedition members oh if something happens you can just go get out through the door you can get extracted or something through the door right but then the biologist was thinking when she was there it's like oh it was all fake there's no real exit or something mm, like that right, right? Yeah. yeah um was it her or her husband i think the husband tried to walk Maybe. far and they kept walking and they didn't reach any border but yeah oh yeah, yeah, yeah. along the coastline yeah mm -hmm. yeah plus it's it's also sort of floated about this problem about the fact that they need to be hypnotized through the trauma of crossing the border mm. you know that that that, that they need to be prepared for that. So actually crossing back over would seem to be an also a trauma of the sort. Although it's all suspected that there's another way in and out of, of area of X that they haven't thought about, which seems to yeah, be a psychologist the can go through because she sort of sort of partially hypnotized themselves because she mm -hmm. needs to meet everyone else, right? So maybe yeah. that's why she's the only one that can do it on her own. Yeah, she can actually look for it. She knows where it is and what to look for. But she mm -hmm. others under hypnosis won't know. Yeah, but if she has been there before in the first book, again, this is from the biologist's perspective, so it could be just a misinterpretation of mm -hmm. information. But isn't there a moment where she feels like the psychologist is expressing fear or regret at having come to the expedition, like like mm -hmm. she was in over her head, uh, and she was regretting it, or maybe she was acting, <laughs> or the biologist was misreading her signals. I mean, we did best get the psychologist perspective, right, in this book for like a short little bit. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember what she thinks about coming there. But I think you're right. Maybe she's like, she's not sure if it was the right decision, right? Like, should I? Yeah. I don't um, understand or whatever. 
There's there's also the intimation that the words that he ended up painting over on the wall, etc., were the psychologist's own words as well. You know, that she kind of brought them to and from the because we, we thought it was the crawler that had kind of instigated it, but they might have just come from again. Does it come from one side of the breach or does it come from yeah. our side of the breach? It's it's, it's kind of like the, mm. these two lines are getting mixed up and crossed as to who's doing what and where it's coming from the origin, you know, where it's all going, the bleeding of the two words. Yes, that I, I had the same question too, uh, whether the crawler's words were what were being repeated here or if the crawler was taking from the psychologist uh, words on the wall. It is mm. only one wall's worth of words but i think the crawler it wasn't large blocks of text right they were pretty big and they could have just have been a few sentences at a, at a time so it it could in theory be both right. <laughs> i i love that moment of uncertainty slash fear when was it the linguist <laughs> she's like there's no way he's still writing right he'd be very old by now there's no way he's still <laughs> writing <laughs> on that yeah. wall well, they say they're pretty sure that the words are from Saul Evans. Now, if the crawler is Saul Evans or whatever, how those words got from Saul Evans to there, I don't know. Mm. We don't know. But they seem pretty sure, I guess, that they're from him. And, and I keep coming back to the fact that there's three people in the photo. <laughs> I mean, I've seen enough of yeah. uh... Yeah. Movies, etc. You know, definitely start focusing on Saul Evans now. One because we've got his name, but also that there is a this female character that we see her, her face half in shadow, and I'm like, okay, so yeah, there's a female figure with her face half in shadow. Uh, how's that gonna be? <laughs> you think we? Do you think we know, or we have had any clues on how they have, who they ever two are? Maybe we don't recognize them, but. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have a real clue. I mean, they can always speculate, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, if if mm -hmm. if this is a time thing, then it could be uh, a whole slew of people that we've met yeah. already. <laughs> well, Jared, we are on speculative speculation, so let's hear your, <laughs> yeah. your speculation. Let's hear it. It's true. <laughs> Tell us. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I I was wondering if one of them. The, especially the one with the blurred face was mm. either the psych the psychologist or the biologist, one of those two. Mm. Um, and I was, you know, that was just like, oh. And but how would that happen? You know, I don't have no idea. But you know, it's just uh, it's just popped into my head when I when they described that picture. Would it make sense time wise? Like that picture is from no. the seventies. I want right. Was it from seventies? Yeah, but remember. where did you know where did the psychologist go and where mm. did the or it was mm. maybe the biologist's mother or something again or, that idea yeah. that the that. that the psych that the biologist might know more about psych the area X than anybody else. Part of that psychological profile is that she's more of a link to that place than say just her husband. I don't know. This is just, yeah. or control. I, I would <laughs> yeah, I would be surprised if when that reveal comes to, to who those people are, that it is totally out of the blue. I think that's mm, one of the things okay. that would be. I would be surprised if it was completely unknown, especially with the description of how it's been meted out to us at this stage. It seems always in like a throwaway line, but again, because we're like four hundred pages into this, this two, these two books at the moment, and we have still got mystery upon mystery upon mystery, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible that, that an author is able to do that and still keep your interest level mm. at, at this point, uh, where you're like, ah, oh, let's, let's go for it. Let's keep on going. Let's find more mysteries and more questions. It's going to be pretty interesting when you discover who they are. <laughs> hmm. I was wondering that if we will discover who it who it is before the end of the trilogy. Well, well the fourth book is coming, but um, what makes it more interesting, I think, is that we've we've it's been mentioned about the different dimensions, and they've kind of a, they kind of hinted around like time is different there, and you kind of wonder like. Mm. So, kind of anything's in play. It sounds like it can be pretty much damn near anything. Yeah. Mm. yeah, but we have that information that the stars are also different, and there's and they walk like long way. Like it seems everything is distorted there, right? Because we walk along yeah. the beach and they never get to oh, to yeah. where we want yeah. to end. But when they turn back, it only takes them like a day to get back from where they started. Hmm. 
Interesting, yeah. yeah. Do you think they just lied to the people in the expedition about where the border is once they enter Area X? They don't know what the inside looks like. So how can they possibly tell them where to go? Well, we know from control that reading the files and all their information from outside, but they know exactly, like it's not huge, right? Mm. They say, they say, I think exactly how big it is, how many miles it is. I think they say it, uh, but it's, okay. yeah. I, I think we know that it's small enough they would have been able to cover the distance by foot in that time. Yeah. Mm. Unless, so, yeah. Do you think the descriptions of the descriptions of pristine wilderness that we get are they uh, the aerial shots of Area X, yes. or is it based on the descriptions of the people who oh, returned shots. from there? Because if it's just aerial shots, has it been implied that what they see is not what we got in the first book, that it's not yeah. quite as clean and pristine as they might think, that it's maybe messy and wild with reed monsters and topographic anomalies. And mm. <laughs> I love that yeah. there was a chapter that I <laughs> named typographic anomalies immediately <laughs> after. <Yeah. laughs> Topological, sorry, not topographic. I mixed up both words. Sorry, Chris, you were saying. No, I was going to say, and it's also interesting that Control has made the observation that to him, there is no physical evidence that the area X is expanding the kind of, again, this truth that we were given in Annihilation to say, oh, this is a right. definite that's going to happen. And, and yet to him, the physical infrastructure of where the border is and the things that are around it seem to sense to him that this thing hasn't changed in size at mm -hmm. all. So again, where's that coming from uh, in terms of area X? Yeah, because the they have like places. a structure, right? They have like yeah. a wooden thing at the entrance, and there's like posts around uh, or where the military stand. The road is where they built the road, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. they, they wouldn't notice it. It's changed. That's true. If the, if the shimmering wall moved, did I get the word shimmer from the movie? Yes, I did. But the wall with the light, uh, that that should have moved, right? They would have seen that. And... Yeah, pretty sure, yeah. But they do know, I think we. Well, we don't know, but they told Control that um, it, all the analysis they do, like the satellites looking inside, and like um, I think like optical analysis of the air and stuff like that is that's what tells them that it's pristine. But also, all the people that go inside and all the notebooks, they mm. also they say it's pristine. Uh, yeah. And but they also get like the samples that they get. I think they say something like, oh, the, all the most recent, the more time passes, sort of, the more samples we get, the more those samples are like missing all the contaminants from industrialization mm -hmm. or all mm. those things, right? Yeah, yeah. Pristine again. So yeah. that makes sense. It's not just the satellite view then. Right, yeah. If I remember correctly, yeah. Yeah. No. I. I almost think that what they see from the satellite images is some sort of illusion, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. just like the border is that what you look inside, maybe it's different. I can't say I have reason to believe that, though. I just have this impression of a landscape that's sort of just an extension of everything else around it, but closed off. And that's what they see. But with an area X, there's a lot more to it. Because mm -hmm. can they see the top? type top, topological topological anomalies can they see that from the air do you think or did they just get that from the expedition notes it seemed it seemed to be that they only got the tunnel tar pit whatever they they want to describe it from the expedition notes or from the journals mm -hmm. rather than um doing because they they i mean that's part of the problem is is can you describe it and they'll just mm -hmm. like i don't know what you're talking about but the new <laughs> Did they not? Do they not see the lighthouse from? Because you had the coast guard patrolling out there and the stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Did do they not see the lighthouse or? I feel like they might see it. Yeah. I feel like it's sort of, but I don't think they see like the people or anything else inside because no, they're always too far away from that, to yeah. see. Like we don't even know if they see like the camp that they built, right? I would guess, but they don't see it. I would guess. <laughs> Yeah, and but they I might have know. known it was there from before it was Area X, if you know what I mean. There might have been a mm. lifehouse there beforehand. Right. Like, That's what I was wondering. It, yeah. 
but it is but it is interesting how when they're doing the investigations with everybody that returns that everybody's very quick to talk about the lighthouse but nobody wants to talk about the 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 tunnel tower pit whatever way you want to do it it's like everybody's sort of yeah. like what, what are you talking about that that's very almost obscured from from the memory yeah if, even the biologist i assuming she's telling the truth about what she remembers i think she attributes the drowning to something that happened in the lighthouse not the tower hmm. that's the, right what do you think of the fact that um, no two journals have the same description of the tunnel slash tower? Yes, yeah. good point. That's pretty freaky. That kind of mm. leaves more credence to the fact that maybe what the psychologist was seeing was not the reality, was manipulation by the spores or something? Yes, well. That was that was noted, wasn't it? When uh, the psychologist made the notes that uh, she'd been exposed to, to the tunnel of the power. I'm trying to remember the exact words. It was written in shorthand, but uh, she had made notes to the fact that the bell just was was compromised by the spores. She knew that she'd been exposed to it hmm. in some way. So the oh, yeah. the spores manipulate what you see of the tower. Do Perception, you think possibly? Hmm. Maybe. Interesting. It could also be that the tower shifts and goes through phases, and if, you know, like I wouldn't be surprised by that either. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's intimated even in, in the first book in Annihilation that some people very definitely see it as a tunnel, and some people see it as a tower. So, I mean, it's sort of indicated at that point that not everybody's seeing the same thing, even from mm. the same expedition. Hmm. Maybe it's all psychological. Maybe it's just a thing which is not interpretable by human eyes. So every person brains interprets in a different way mm. and sort of related but new topic the words that the psychologist got do you think that she got it from her own visit to the uh, to area x or has it been repeated mm. from one of the notebooks i think they do say that it's in some notes right they just don't like copying it because it apparently eats into them. Uh, that's another thing that we should probably talk about, that all of them feel terrified by reading mm. the words, which we saw control experience. But the others said we don't like duplicating it. There's some sort of superstition around it. Yeah. But we were not surprised by the words. We're like, OK, yeah, we know these words, right? Yeah. yeah. They, they said they don't put it in a lot of uh, documentation because control hasn't mm. seen them it's the first time he sees the first yeah. time he sees him is on the wall so they're like yeah um but does, does nobody else keep on rereading the words now thinking that if i read them now they'll have extra meaning compared to no because we have 400 pages of what's been going on here and still not quite there but i i sort of get the feeling that at some stage i will read the words and go it was all right there. <laughs> <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> Is, is this the biggest paragraph we've gotten of these words, or did we get it before, too? I don't, I don't remember it being this long, but certainly because it did. It oh, yeah. Got that me was to read long, quite a yeah. long way, yeah, through it. Mm. And, oh, um, there was one bit in this. I think, uh, let me see what part I highlighted. Yeah, the shadows of the abyss are like the petals of a monstrous flower that shall blossom within the skull and expand the mind beyond what any man can bear. That sounds an awful lot like what the psychologist, mm -hmm. like what happened to the psycho, not psychologist, sorry. Biologist. Biologist, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, true. Yep, that's, uh, it's got to be spore invasion. <laughs> yeah <laughs> isn't that cool the sport it's it's like a leech it's telling you what it's going to do before it does it <laughs> it's like the leech numbs you before <laughs> it starts to suck your blood <laughs> oh, that's a nice thought <laughs> <laughs> here to impart nice thoughts <laughs> so that's i'm sorry go ahead at the uh at the end of chapter 15 um did anybody get this sense that there's something else going on here with the voice and and hypnosis? Because like oh. earlier earlier in the book, there was one part where control 
he like blinked once, twice, and three times, and then as as he was talking to to vo- the voice, and then uh, it was just a, like a little mention in a sentence, you know, like earlier in the chapter, mm-hmm. I don't know, ten, and mm-hmm. then we get to the end of chapter fifteen here, and uh, the voice is like. Um, just stabilize and do your job. Para- mm. Paralysis is not a cogent uh, uh, option either. Uh, you will get good. Sl- you will get good sleep tonight. You know, yeah. not like not like go get some rest. You know, be you know, do yourself a. F- it's like you will get good sleep tonight. And this says stabilize paralysis cogent. And as he hung up, he was alarmed to realize that he actually did feel as if he had been stabilized. So I'm like, is there some kind of hypnosis going on here with this mm-hmm. whole phone call thing with with um with the voice? I mean of course it's named the voice. So mm-hmm. uh you know, does this voice have some sort of power? And if that's the case, are we able to believe everything that's coming out of controls? My, you again, know, yeah. thoughts here. Be, once again, the unreliable narration of control because is he being controlled, you know? And so mm-hmm. I'm just, it just set my mind racing that whole, that last sentence that we read. And I'm like, ah, now I'm not going to find out for another week. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I doubt we're going to find out for a lot, not going to find out for a lot be, longer than a week. Even longer. <laughs> I know, yeah. uh, but so that, but that, that was kind of a disturbing end of that chapter yeah. right there. And, 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 uh, it made me really start rethinking everything we've read up to this point. Like, okay, what's actually going on here? Um, he's trying to find out stuff, but is he going to be allowed to, because is he being controlled in some manner? And, mm. uh, so that that's uh, that's where I'm left. <laughs> it's, it yeah. sort of brings up something to me about control himself. For somebody that has seen the field throughout an awful lot of his life, he seems quite capable. This is the mm. bit that I'm sort of having trouble with. He's, he is not a patsy or a somebody that's been plunked in, not right. knowing what he's going to do. He has a plan, and he has he's he's very careful and guarded about what he's doing. He seems like somebody that's incredibly capable, and yet he has only ended up in this position because. He couldn't do anything else, or he's failed and everything else, or his morals meant that he couldn't do other jobs, for instance, that he's went through. Mm-hmm. So I think it's an interesting kind of um, thing to ponder as to who this guy control is. Again, a bit like the biologist in book one, we're in this person's head for all the book two, and we sort of feel like we know him, but what we actually know about him is very, very little, other than just his thoughts in the moment. Mm-hmm. Sure. And and if the voice does turn out to be his mother, how messed up is that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, this is hypnotizing. Honestly, though, given what we know about her, I feel like she wouldn't have trouble doing that to her son. Yep. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Still, Maybe that's... she's been psychologically conditioning him for his whole life since he was a child. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. He'd be that's... a better agent, though. This is next level. Yeah. Or maybe she wants him to sort of fail so he can position him in this, I don't know, in mm. this position, yeah. I guess. I don't know. I don't know. But it's... again, the, the idea that the voice is, again, we sort of are led to assume that it's somebody higher up in the government. But again, we know nothing about no. where the voice is coming from or mm-hmm. even, you know, anything about it. It could be from within Area X. It could be, you know, it could be the biologist, it could be the psychologist, it could be the, you know, all these things are possible, but that idea of the um, I hadn't thought about the about the hypnosis angle of that, and certainly that again, his nickname is Control. The fact that the, the yeah. his parent might have even done it from a very early age, that Control being a name might be part of his conditioning. Yeah. Uh, there was just something, the, yeah, there yeah. was something about that last paragraph and those sequence mm-hmm. of words and how yeah. it was put out, and I was just like. All right, there's something even more going on here. Interesting. Well, it, sure. the the last few words, now, like you mentioned, Jared, <clears throat> stabilized paralysis and cogent, and then it seems like controls outlook changed. So, I think there are certain keywords, just like there was in the in the expedition we were al- along with, that they're using hypnosis on Demi or pretty much I would imagine everybody. Like, 
they're controlling everything, but then uh, who's controlling it? Yeah, right. Yeah, mm-hmm. and why? Yeah, yeah. Well, on that note, I think I have to leave you guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, we yeah. we change the schedule. I'll message you on the forum. Okay. Yeah. For the next know. two weeks. Yeah. Okay. okay. Amazing. Okay. See you. Thanks for the discussion. Thanks, Tom. See you guys later. Bye. Bye, Dan. So, to your point, Chris, about uh, the, a- yeah, I think there's an interesting parallel with um, control and the biologist, right? They're both so considered failures in their field, but they're really good at what they do mm-hmm. in the things that matter for what they try to do, right? The biologist becomes one with the environment. She doesn't <laughs> follow through on the aspects of research that she's supposed to. But she's a good biologist in that she understands her environment and she likes to learn things about it. Same with uh, control. He's apparently failing because he's too empathetic sometimes, but he's a bloody good detective, it seems like. Mm. Either that or those dreams are telling him more than what we know of what he's sharing with us. But even without that, I, I think he's doing a really good job of deducing a lot of information right? So yeah, I think that's a really interesting parallel there with both of them, what you brought up. Mm. Yeah. What do you think the thing on the roof was that uh, control that will control up? Mm. No information. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbits, mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> Where did the phone come from that's in his bag? Yeah. You know, the, oh, there's really lots of yeah. interesting stuff that's yeah that's hanging about there. The only thing that that was that I definitely found out is that the psychologist is not the plant. I can't tell you how disappointed I was <laughs> to find that the psychologist was not didn't come back as the plant. I thought that was that that was gonna be very exciting. Could have come back <laughs> as a dead mouse, but 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 definitely not the plant because the plant was there <laughs> beforehand. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> So one, sorry, one last thing that I wanted to bring up was the whole pristine wilderness of it all. Like, what do you think that, uh, what do you think the significance of that is for the story? And I guess for the themes of the book in general, like that keeps coming up that there is no human generated toxins. Do you think Mm -hmm. maybe some species got angry? (laughs) Uh, I'm thinking of... uh, rejoice or whatever <laughs> that uh, someone got angry and decided to stage an intervention and say enough i'm going to create this clear area um that's pristine or like doesn't have to be an alien species maybe some human species decided to like create the screen of not human uh, earthly species decided to create this uh wall of protection like somehow that happened something evolved to that extent mm-hmm. or do you think yeah i mean i mean like those are the possibilities but more i feel like do you think that in terms of the themes of the story do you think vandermeer is heading towards making a point about human neglect of the environment mm-hmm. mm. yeah because the focus isn't hasn't been on the environment and you wonder if that's the, been the problem the whole time because we're so they're so focused on the lighthouse that they miss everything else the the focus has been on the wrong thing so i think there's something there mm. i sort of wish i'd read more jeff on books to kind of get a sense of the things that are important to him in terms yeah. of things of his writing and i would maybe know more which in its own way is a good thing going in completely blind because it kind of gives you the sense of well i don't know what what this could be about or what the kind of major things are going to be about by the end of the book but it, it there is definitely is that idea that this area is free from man-made messing. You know, the, mm. the, the man has yeah. not been able to have an effect in here, and it has been very much, for want of a better word, controlled uh, in terms of what gets in or out of this and in whatever way. You know. Mm. Well, I guess that's part of the question, though: is is it controlled, or is it a um, some sort of weird alien natural defense system against? Mm. Uh, the planet uh, being uh, poisoned and um, 
mm-hmm. you know, remains to be seen, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Anything else to talk about before we move on to the short story? There was uh, something I forget. Go ahead, Chris. No, I was just going to say, I probably should let you go first, but I, I kind of read these kind of 80, 90 pages and kind of went, God, we'll not be talking for very long about this because while there's a lot of stuff that happened, I don't know if we really got answers and we got just more questions, etc. Mm. But, you know, one hour <laughs> in, here we are. <laughs> Isn't that the case all the way? Yeah, indeed. The, uh, the things that Control sees, the, and that he hears and sees, you, you kind of wonder if he's been either hypnotized or infected somehow or kind of he's been around the area and you wonder what's been what's happened to him that he's seen these things or has he learned too much and he's it's getting to his head if it's a something within himself or if it's something else external that's making him see things or or kind of so but i'm not sure and then everyone seems very casual about this <laughs> about this plant and this mouse like Oh, we just watered this plant. It seems a little like a little strange. Get rid of it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. we've tried, we've tried doing stuff there, but it, it's not going anywhere. What uh, What protective measures do you think they took before they decided it's okay to take it out of that cathedral with five airlocks in it? <laughs> <laughs> because they took masks with them on the expedition. The director slash psychologist knew about that. And also, if she's aware of the tower, why didn't they wear masks the first time? Maybe she wants to see people infected and how they behave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and what's what's so special about the biologist that it doesn't seem like they trusted her very much, that they knew that she was a little bit of loose cannon, she wasn't that reliable, but they still wanted her, and they seemed like she was susceptible to, to contamination is kind of the... So mm-hmm. why bring her along... What's special about the biologist that hmm. she was so important? Because she seemed to be, because the other people in her expedition seemed to be kind of afterthoughts to the biologist. Because they yeah. almost like predicted that she would prefer it there, that she would be feel at home there. Mm-hmm. So if the director had been there before, what did she discover that made her think the biologist was so important? That's a good question. Yeah. Do you, do you think that's still centered around the topological anomaly, or do you think it's about other aspects of Area X? That it, that's just a huge misdirection, and we should be looking at other things there. I wonder if it's because she would be focused on the environment, and she would have that would be her where her focus is, and not so much the the tower or the tunnel mm. or the lighthouse, because her. It seemed like her focus is more on the environment and what was happening around those things and not so much those landmarks. So maybe they wanted a different perspective or mm. I'm not sure. That's interesting. Yeah. Someone who wouldn't focus quite as much. Yeah, that, that's good. I I like that. Maybe we'll see where that goes. Do you think the uh, control, the information that he gave her that the director is the same as the psychologist, do you think that's going to be misused by the biologist later on. Do you think there's a version of the biologist inside Area X still who might be communicating with the psychologist in some form? Many questions. Oh, that's creepy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 cool. All right, then shall we talk about Sultana's dream? Sultana's dream. Yes. What did you think of it? Published in 1907 by Rokhaya Shekhawat Hussain, in which a woman oh. visits a feminist utopia. I had 1905. Oh, 1905, right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was remembering the date from the, the story for next week. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yes. So... Maybe I can start us off with this question. Do you think that the place where she went is a feminist utopia? Would you call it that, given whatever definitions of said words you would use? Or is it, would you even call it a utopia? Or would you call it something else? (laughs) 
I sort of think that's the point of the story is that it's supposed to engender, especially given when it was written, uh, pre even the uh, the vote changing rules, etc., in Britain, except all that kind of stuff, and predates that as to whether this this place that they've created, this utopian society, if you want, the feminist utopian society, if you want, is a workable society. Mm. Uh, and that it, if it is it is something that we should be even striving towards or kind of the problems as uh, using it as a mirror towards modern society or society then, you know, I think that's one of the big parts of it. And uh, I think that's what makes it a really interesting story for me because it does explore that idea quite and asks all the questions that you should ask because of that. It doesn't kind of just do the thing of, well, here's an idea and just leave it to you. It actually poses the questions of the readers as it goes through. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I kind of liked how she um, she pointed out all the the negativity that the men being in charge throughout the first half of the story here. You know, the uh, like she says right away, you need not be afraid of a man here. And she says, this, this place is free of sin and harm. And, um, you know, and like when they, she thought of something that men could do that she said something about, they couldn't find a better excuse and they're in their proper places where they ought to be. And, uh, and, but she also points out that, um, it's, you know, the, uh, the, you know the the men think the women are naturally weaker, and in India the the man's the lord and master. So she, you know this stuff keeps getting pointed out and pointed out as you're going on, and finally it's finally it's called Ladyland, which gives you a hint that it's you know that right. it's this utopian made up place, and um, the uh, but then they they point out um, you know the seclusion is the same, like the seclusion. Mm -hmm of the men in this utopian lady land is the same as the seclusion of the women in reality. And, um, so you, you start to wonder if it is a utopia or if it's just like an opposite dream, you know, just mm -hmm. yeah, flip the role, flip the role type of dream, you know? Um, and so it, you know, it's kind of a statement on that, on that part of society that, says you know if you have a society that's that's um such a place where women have are suppressed in this manner would it be better if men were suppressed in the same manner and that's the question i think she's ultimately raising with this uh little piece hmm. steve do you want to go next I actually got called into work earlier, so I didn't get to try to get to the short story. So I'll just sit here and be quiet. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's fine. Sorry. Um, I, um, yeah, I think I think I tend to rail at at versions or like seemingly utopian versions of the world where somebody's still getting oppressed, right? Like this opposite dream. I don't think this is a utopia, and I don't think the author is indicating it to be like sure she's pointing out how things are better or different in this world but i feel like the intent might be more for sort of the shock value of like more from the point of view of well two two purposes i would think one to show men just how silly their uh, versions of the world is like whoever's responsible for deciding women get to sit in the zenana and i will go rule the world um they uh telling them that it doesn't have to be this way that if you flip things one you won't be too happy about it that's what you're doing to us and two uh women could make the same excuses you do and, and continue to rule the world so it doesn't have to be one over the other we can work equally i feel like that i mean i at least want to read it that way and i think that's how it's meant to be i don't think she's saying women will inherently build a better world just yeah. that they would build a different world yeah. if they were in power it's still not going to be fun for whoever's going to be locked up um all day in the zanana uh the other would be i think 
to show women they don't have to be locked up, right? Like whoever's okay with this, whoever's okay with the status quo, like Sultana seems to be okay with it. The one who had the dream, she has all these questions, but, oh, we are weaker. Why would we go out into the world? Oh, but we don't understand things. So why would we do this? So sort of the women who are inclined to buy into the status quo, I think, showing them that things could be different. But I feel like there's a bit of a danger in presenting things this way because then you're sort of asking for the opposite world. Uh, there was someone who, who uh, I think it was some village in Bengal or something where they're like, oh, you know what? Things are opposite there. Women go out to work, men stay home, take care of the kids. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. But like, do the men like doing that? Ultimately, what it comes down to is each person should have the freedom to do what they want without having some norms imposed on them to say, you can't do this because you're female or you're weaker or whatever BS reason you want to come up with. I think flipping is never the answer. So it's not... So while I appreciate the story for that, like I feel like <laughs> making the same point slightly differently would be my preference. But yeah, for all that, I I like the story and I like what it's trying to do and the points that it's making on a larger level. Yeah. I mean, you know, in this, given the time period this is written, um, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the oppositeness of it, I think the opposite has to be brought up Hmm. In order to get to that equilibrium, where 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 it would be better for everybody, um, so I think that's all she's doing is just bring is, yeah. is bringing it up. <laughs> that that yeah. makes sense. And and for me, I mean, this is my favorite short story that we've done so far because I think oh, really? it does exactly what science fiction short stories should do, which is present an idea and let you work through the good, the bad, you know, what, what, what it actually is doing. Because it does actually ask the question very directly. Well, what well, what role do men have in society now? Mm. Like, what, what, what has it? And the story's dismissive of it because it is a very feminist society. It's a completely flipped society at that stage. And I yeah. think, again, as you've made the point, it is very much to then use that as a lens to say, well, there's still problems in the society. There's still, uh, you know, if we have half the people that don't have our own society and they're literally, literally kept locked up, uh, mm. for for their own sake, then then we don't have a utopian society that it, it isn't actually what it purports to be, and it also uses the metaphor of the fact that um, men aren't the top of the food chain. Like lions are more powerful than the men, yet yeah. lions do not rule rule the earth. So there's more to being powerful than just brute, brute force uh, mm. and uh, uh, physicality. There's more to it, and we should maybe spend more time being making smart decisions than than decisions based on, on mm. beating somebody down or otherwise uh, from that. So I, I, I really enjoyed the story at all from start to finish. Thanks. thought it was great. Yeah. The other thing that I thought the story did really well, uh, I think a lot of uh, modern feminist stories, at least the ones that I've read, they tend to show strong women by just giving them traditionally male roles mm. i think that in the story the world that the women make is different because they employ things that or rather they overcome typical weaknesses that are attributed to women by doing things a different way right mm. like acknowledge that women tend to be less strong than men and then you know how do you get over that you choose to use your brain, build devices that you can use to burn people <laughs> with using sunlight. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but yeah, I, I like that they built a fundamentally different world, albeit with similar problems, but they had yeah. different ways to solve it. And not because like, you know, this the women think a certain way or whatever. It's just that they overcame their weaknesses in that manner. Right. And I really like that. Like they didn't just say women are strong too and we can do all the things that men can do. It is yes, but also we do them differently, which I appreciate it. But it was also the idea of using using alternate solutions to problems, wasn't it? Because it was very much when the man said, Well, what are you gonna do? 
uh, we're all just ready to kill ourselves. And the women said, well, we're going to try something. We're like, well, OK, you go do that and we'll get ready to kill ourselves uh, because it's obviously not going to work. But, and regardless of whether it's just using your brain or whatever way you want to pigeon it, it was the kind of idea that there's more than one solution to your problem. And mm. that actually society's betterment if we if we use kind of the whole breadth of opinion rather than just kind of one way of doing it, even if it's a traditional way to do it or otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And and I thought that the story was heading a bit towards some, what what we call them, environmental themes, when it started with, oh, we use solar energy, we don't burn things. Mm -hmm. but, then, but then it goes on to say, we also pluck water directly from the clouds. Like, that doesn't sound right. very environment friendly. But, but I think the point it's making is probably about, you know, different solutions to the problem. Yeah. 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 I like that, that, that there's more than one way to solve a problem. Nice. Yeah. And and normally, normally I dislike stories that end with, and then I woke up type of situation. <laughs> uh, but this one didn't bother me as much uh, when it came to that. But when I first read it, I was like, ah, oh, then she wakes up. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but then you know but it was so short and it was it was um you know the rest was the rest was like what we've been talking about it was uh you know pretty cool yeah. points so <laughs> yeah yeah and apparently this is oh i don't have my book with me but the it's a certain style with this conversational style used to teach uh yeah. or impart knowledge a certain way like where there's someone who knows more than the other person and she used it to make a point about society. Apparently, there are more stories coming up in the collection that use it for different ways. It, it has a name. I forget what it's called, this style of story, but structurally interesting too, I think, this one. Yeah. Did I didn't see the name of a translator on the story. So do you think the original was in English? I couldn't figure it out, I don't think. Um, I because I... the next one has a, has the name of a translator on it. Right. Okay. I didn't see one here, but yeah, no. Maybe no. it's anonymous translation. <laughs> <laughs> cool. cool. Anything else to talk about this story? No, I recommend. It's short yeah. and sweet. Yeah. yeah. It's a good story and made me think a lot. For sure. Right. <laughs> uh in that case, we'll see everyone in a week from now. For next week, we're reading chapters sixteen to twenty-two. And the short story, The Triumph of Mechanics, uh, by Karl Hans Strobe. Yes, I got all of that correctly. <laughs> um, so see everyone in a week uh, with more authority and short stories. Thank you so much for listening. Bye.